uh, we seem to have a fantastic turnout already and people are still arriving so uh, that's incredible and also people from all over the world and all different uh, sectors which is really really important I think because this really is a multidisciplinary issue and topic that we're discussing here today. So I think really it's clear to uh, say that everybody knows about plastics. This is what we're talking about here today is plastics and the problems surrounding plastics and how we might be able to solve those problems. And everybody worldwide, I would say, is aware of plastic as being an environmental issue. We see plastics in the media all the time. We know that there's lots of uh, research ongoing. A lot of people here will be actively engaged in that research or engaged in, in related work. Um, but we also uh, know that the general public are quite aware of this issue. For example, all you have to do is leave your house, look at your local streets, your local parks, and you'll see plastic everywhere. So all the research that's ongoing is really important to try and help us understand the problem of plastics. So where are the plastics coming from that are entering the environment? which are the key culprits, so the types of materials or the types of products that are ending up as waste within the environment. How are these being transported and what are the potential long term ecological and human health effects? Now, one of the uh, things when we're talking about plastics is that there are lots of different definitions of different types of plastics. And one of the things that we're especially interested in uh, here today as well as general plastics, because this is the bigger issue, but uh, we're looking especially at things like microplastics. So these are plastics that are defined as being less than five millimetres in size. Uh, and these are really a challenge for researchers and for people trying to develop solutions because they're so small. Often, if you look for these plastics in the environment, you won't find them even if they're there, unless you use very technical methods. Uh, they're difficult, therefore, to monitor and almost impossible to remove from the environment. Uh, nonetheless, we do need solutions to prevent big plastics and small plastics, either from entering the environment or from causing problems once they get there. We know that more plastic waste is produced globally than we can physically manage at the moment. So we do need to try and work out ways in which we might be able to better deal with that. So the question is, do we try and deal with it once it's in the environment? We know there's lots of plastic already there that we won't be able to remove necessarily. So what do we do about that plastic that already exists? But then also, how do we prevent more plastic from reaching the environment? Can we look at ways of maybe degrading plastics before they reach the environment, better ways of reusing materials or recycling materials? So, for example, changing the system altogether, how we use uh, different materials um, and really are any or all of these solutions feasible on a large scale? Because we know that these are going to be needed at a very large scale for the amount of, of plastic material that we're producing. I think it's really clear as well that not one sole solution will be possible to be applied across all instances. So we really need a multidisciplinary approach to try and tackle this issue. Uh, and that's really what we're here to talk about today is some of these potential uh, solutions or mitigation strategies and ways in which we can try and start thinking about how we, we challenge and change this plastic problem within the environment. So I'm really pleased that we've got four fantastic speakers who are going to talk to us about different aspects of their work and how it relates to plastics uh, and the solutions that we might be able to apply. So I'm going to start uh, with our first speaker, who is Dr Christian Dunn. So he's Associate Director of the Bangor Wetlands Group. He's an active researcher and lecturer in wetland science and also Director of the Plastic Research Centre in Wales. Um, he's going to talk to us about some of his work on biological remediation, specifically related to constructed wetlands and microplastic capture. So Christian, if you're ready, I will pass over to you. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed. I'll just try to share my screen. This worked before and I do, I must, must start off by saying I do feel um, mixed feelings about talking about plastic because I'm considering the amount of Lego um, that is currently behind me, um, but it is not single use. Um, so that's 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 how I'm going to defend my uh, children's obsession with Lego. Obviously nothing to do with me whatsoever. Um, so yes, I've been asked to speak to you about some of the work. Can everyone see and hear me, by the way, before I just keep on talking to the void? Can yes. everyone see everything? Brilliant, super. Okay, so yeah, so we're going to talk to you about some of the work that we are doing at Bangor University, um, which is using constructed treatment wetlands to potentially remove microplastics um, from our water. 
and it's some work that we've been doing now for a while um, and other universities are looking at it too and other researchers as well uh, and I know that I'm talking to a very varied audience which is fantastic um, and so I don't really need to talk about plastics but maybe I need to kind of explain what I mean when I'm talking about uh, constructed treatment wetlands so these are wetlands um, which we build to remove various types of pollutants and you know the classic example which people will probably know is kind of kind of the bottom right hand picture there which is a reed bed um, and people use these um, to clean their septic tanks uh, as the kind of the final kind of um, cleaning system for their septic tanks um, you often see them um, all uh, next to kind of um, uh, all sorts of buildings nowadays and on the sides of roads as well um, but they can be made to look however you want them. You know, we've got some really good pictures there on the top right, um, which is a fantastic um, treatment wetland um, using a, a cell system. Um, not only is it incredibly effective at removing different types of waterborne pollutants, um, but they also look fantastic too, or can do if you build them correctly. Um, they can be very functional, like the one on the left, the top left, um, and but they also provide additional um, benefits as well as well as cleaning water um, they are or can be attractive places for people to visit um, they are, are um, create habitats and can become relatively biodiverse areas sometimes in areas where you know there is a, a lack of biodiversity so incredible um, uh, resources which we have to treat a whole range of pollutants. Some of them can be small like that rebird on the, the bottom right and then some of them can be on a landscape scale. So for example the picture at the bottom right there is in Florida and that's the Everglades stormwater treatment area and this is about twice the size of Bristol. Um, I know it's very large because I was once, the first time I visited it I was uh, slightly jet lagged and um, I was given a, a ride through it in one of the, the four by fours and I managed to have two naps from one end to the other so I know it is an incredibly large area um, and this area is used to treat the water that is flowing out of Lake Okeechobee and the surrounding area as well before it then flows through the Everglades because they have a serious issue there with high nitrates and high phosphates completely altering um, the, um, the vegetation and the whole landscape of the Florida Everglades. So small scale large scale and they all work though pretty much the same way and that is you have this wonderful r combination of substrate soil microbes in that soil plants and then the rhizosphere um, in that soil and the microbe uh, microbial um, communities which form in that area and then you have the plants themselves and they all act together to treat to clean remove filter break down lots of different types of pollutants we are talking nitrates phosphates but we're also talking heavy metals pharmaceutical waste illicit drug waste a whole range of different pollutants industrial pollutants household pollutants agricultural pollutants they can remove and clean lots of them from our water and my research is based, a lot of my research is based around treatment wetlands and the biogeochemical cycles in wetlands and how we can design wetlands, treatment wetlands slightly differently to remove different types of pollutants, how we can perfect their design. And that was one of my areas of my research. But then around about four or five years ago, I started getting interested in plastics just personally um, and started kind of uh, doing some, uh, some some work to try to get people to, to cut down on their plastic use. And at the time, I have to confess, I started a campaign in my, my local city in Chester and nobody cared whatsoever when I started talking about trying to cut down on plastics until so David Attenborough spoke about it in the Blue Planet and then all of a sudden everybody cared and then we actually started to see some action which was fantastic which shows the power of Sir David Attenborough. Um, but I wanted to combine uh, my interest in, in wetlands or my, my research in wetlands and with, with plastics uh, and so one of the things we started to look at was could we use treatment wetlands to remove microplastics? Could they, are they already removing microplastics and could we then design them differently better to remove even more microplastics so we've started or well, first of all we had to kind of find out where the microplastics were and then this was done say four years ago um, and uh, it was the first time at, at the time now obviously 
this is kind of very old news, but at the time it was the first time that we'd anyone had really looked at inland waters because I, building treatment wetlands for in on the coast um, can be problematic and it, it's, it, it's tricky because you've got saline water. Um, but in inland water, fresh waters, um, they're a very um, simple system in parts to kind of construct and use. So we started to look at all the inland than waters that we could get or kind of get samples from across the UK and obviously we found microplastics in all of them which now is you know, it's not surprising at all but at the time it was a uh, kind of groundbreaking because no one really had done that before in inland waters but in our conclusion we mentioned this we mentioned the idea of designing constructed treatment wetlands specifically for microplastic removal we build constructed treatment wetlands for removing a whole range of different pollutants but up till now, no one has really thought about or had thought about using constructive treatment wetlands to do it. So we did some preliminary, preliminary work and literally we used small scale um, uh, treatment wetlands, literally in our greenhouses. Uh, we grew typha in them. So that's uh, what well, most people know as bulrushes, but it, it's not really bulrushes. They're actually cattails. Bulrushes is kind of a name that's been associated with them, but they're that traditional kind of, or that kind of well-known cigar shaped um, uh, seed head on the plants. And uh, we designed them differently, but with the one we settled for was a subsurface batch loaded system. So basically we had this, this layer of pebbles. We had the reeds inside or, or the typha inside, sorry. And uh, then we put the, put water into it up to just below the level of the gravel and we had a known amount of microplastics in all of the the, um, the wetlands and alongside the wetlands we also had um, the same system but this time just with gravel and then we had it just with water and we wanted to see which was the most effective at removing microplastics so we took regular samples out of these systems um, to see how much microplastic was was being retained um, by the uh, the systems and how much was being released and we found um, that the, uh, tr the the systems that were planted so true treatment wetlands um, were removing significantly more microplastics than the ones that were with gravel and obviously the ones that just had water in them as well. And we concluded that this was because of the dense roots and the stems which typha are well known for and is one of their key, key reasons why we use them in treatment wetlands. Um, so it wasn't the fact that it was the gravel because there is arguments with treatment wetlands whether necessarily you need plants or whether you can just aerate them with kind of um, uh, with mechanical systems. But when it comes to removing microplastics from these treatment wetlands, we found that they had to be planted and it didn't particularly matter what the substrate was. It was all down to the plants and the root systems around the plants um, were the most effective. And then this has obviously been done by other researchers in universities now. And some people are finding that they can remove 80, 85 or even 100 um, percent of the microplastics being added to these treatment wetlands simply by designing their wetlands properly and correctly. Um, and this is something that we are now looking at as well because we really want to kind of perfect this for, for the UK because a lot of this work has been done over in China. And so we are literally trying things out in pint pots um, as you see on the left. But then we also now have an experimental treatment wetland system um, built on Anglesey, which is around about an acre in size. So it's a nice, decent size and it's got kind of replicates in it. And so we'll now be hopefully testing our systems here with uh, microplastics. I and mean, obviously there's lots of uh, ethical and uh, 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 hoops we have to jump through to make sure that we do that in the, the right way. Um, but that's the next stage um, step for our, our project. And we'll be looking there crucially at things like what the, what's the best plants to use, uh, planting regimes, best management for those wetlands, um, flow rates, all these sorts of things that we know and we accept for constructed treatment wetlands. We kind of, we know the science behind it and we know the practicalities for constructed treat wetlands for other pollutants but not for microplastics. So we know that they're really effective or the preliminary data shows they're really effective. Um, so is this the silver bullet? Have we found the solution to removing microplastics from our freshwater systems? Let's just build some constructed treatment wetlands and we can and we can uh, trap and filter out all the microplastics which are in them. Well, no, absolutely 100% not, because we're not removing the problem. We're not getting rid of the problem. All we're doing is concentrating the problem 
in a certain area in our constructed treatment wetlands. The microplastics aren't being broken down and not being kind of got rid of, they're not being um, taken in by the plants and kind of absorbed or anything like that. They're still there in the substrate, in the in the biofilm, um, um, in these in these uh, constructed treatment wetlands. All we are doing is concentrating those microplastics. So we're cleaning the water, but we're concentrating um, the microplastics. And there are other issues as well, which other researchers have found on, we're starting to find as well, is the fact that potentially we could be altering the, um, the properties of that constructed treatment wetland when it comes to removing other pollutants like the nitrogen cycle. And so we might be building these constructed wetlands to remove microplastics. It might be very effective to remove microplastics, but then we are reducing their abilities, for example, to remove nitrogen. And it could be the same for other um, uh, pollutants as well, pharmaceutical waste, industrial waste. So we need to do a lot more research to find out some of these answers. Um, and also as well, well, by concentrating all these microplastics in this area, as the paper on the right is suggesting as well, what you could potentially be doing is creating another problem. This area that you're building then has invertebrates in, it has other organisms in, in them as well, which will then potentially be taking in, ingesting um, these microplastics, which then can enter the food chain in a completely different way to before. So there are issues there. However, on a positive note, for example, if we create these constructed treatment wetlands and if the substrate becomes saturated eventually with microplastics, we as an industry in terms of constructed treatment wetland scientists and, and the industry itself, we're pretty good at dealing with these situations when it comes to other um, buildup of pollutants such as phosphorus, phosphates, when they become um, the substrate of a treatment wetland becomes saturated in phosphorus and we can deal with it um, and we are good at dealing with the substrate from, from, from other pollutants as well when, when sediments, um, uh, when sedimentation happens as well. So we're good at that, we know what to do with the substrate and to clean that substrate but we've never done it for microplastics before so it does present us with a problem without a doubt but let's be positive about this we have the ability to clean water if we know we have a habitat further downstream for example that is um, sensitive to microplastic pollution then we have the ability to clean that water to protect that habitat what we then do with the, the microplastics we're trapping, that's another matter. So it is a case of right wetland, right place. Um, this could work. We need to understand the management of what we're going to do with these treatment wetlands um, when they become saturated with microplastics. And crucially, we are really at the very, literally two or three years into this research across across the globe. And we need to do some more research on this. We don't want, you know, the un, uh, unintended consequences. We need to understand the issue that we are dealing with fully. Um, and if we can understand that, then potentially we may not have a, a silver bullet, um, but we have a tool in our toolbox to deal with the problem of microplastic pollution. That is the hope. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Christian. That's really fascinating. And I think there's very little being done in this space. So I think this is really interesting. I mean, you're probably aware of how little is being done in this space. So I think this is something that's really novel. And people on this call are obviously really interested because there are a few questions. So I would just encourage people, if you do have questions, feel free to write them in the chat. Um, if you'd prefer to ask them via your microphone, then raise your hand and you're welcome to ask it directly as well. So I'll just start. Um, we've got about five minutes before we move to the next speaker. So I'll start with the questions in the chat. And some of these came in as you were speaking, so you might have addressed some of these already. But um, Tom Taylor says, uh, can you say anything about the types of plastics that are removed and also about the eventual fate of these plastics, which I think you'd already touched on in, with respect to them being, uh, you'll have to treat that sediment in some way. But yeah, maybe Indeed, you can elaborate. Yeah. Yes, so when it comes to microplastics, we are seeing as well that they are trapping all types of different types of microplastics. Obviously fibers are the ones which are generally the easiest to trap, but we have seen not my research, other people's research has shown that nanoplastics, so you know, really small bits of plastics are being trapped by these by the, these treatment wetlands as well. So it, it does seem at this stage that we 
are, you be, are able to trap all types of microplastics and nanoplastics using these systems. And then, but the, the question is, what happens to them after? Yeah, I might be able to concentrate them in this area. Brilliant, fantastic. But then what do I do with them? There is some evidence coming out that, you know, there is some degradation of plastics in these areas. Um, but the, how much that is, I don't know. But this is where, you know, um, disciplines could start to combine. If people are working on enzymes or microbes to, to start to break down um, plastics, could we potentially incorporate them into our treatment wetlands? Um, treatment wetlands are, um, the science behind treatment wetlands in general is pretty robust pretty robust in most areas and what we now need to do is take that knowledge and then combine it with our plastic knowledge and then all these other disciplines as well and then hopefully we may come up with as I say it's not a silver bullet but it is hopefully something that can help us. Great thank you and uh, your suggestion of enzymes is a very interesting one because our next two speakers will be talking more about enzymatic degradation so maybe they can elaborate later. So um, we do have examples in constructive treat wetlands where we've seeded them with specific enzymes to break down certain pollutants so we have that knowledge in constructive treatment wetlands so see if we can combine it with this. Yeah excellent um we have another question from ven carter who says uh, can you say anything about the mechanism of removal of microplastics in constructed treatment wetlands so you've mentioned um aggregation in roots and plants being the kind of aggregate there can you say anything more about that it's it is that physical aggregate it is that physical filtering out it seems at the present time Yes, roots crucial, um, stems crucial, but also the biofilms as well. The biofilms that you get in, in treatment wetlands as well, and that's actually acting as a, as 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 a filter, a trap for microplastics as well. So it, again, at the, this present time, it seems that the removal is physical. Um, it's 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 that kind of literally the fact that you've got so much mass of of roots, of stems, of branches biofilms as well, you are able to trap most of microplastics, which is seen by what you do when you have one of these systems is most of the microplastics that you trap are usually in the inlet to show there is a real kind of physical issue going on here. Great, thank you. Um, I think I also already know the answer to this question, but I'm going to pose it anyway. Do you have any idea of when the treatment uh, wetlands get saturated with microplastics and at what point the removal rates decrease? Yes, we don't. We, we don't at the present time. And that is, that's a crucial issue. And it's when it, again, we know this for um, so many different types of pollutants like phosphorus. When when you get to a point where your wetland is saturated, we know that we now need to work out that formula and especially things like retention times. You know, how much flow do you need to put through your wetland and how much microplastics will be removed? The retention time We those very straight straightforward in inverted commas straightforward formula which we know for other pollutants we now need to start working on our, our for microplastics as well excellent so i'll take one more question so there are quite a few in the chat so i don't know if you chris want to address those in the chat but we also have a longer q a at the end of this session so if anybody has questions that don't get addressed now then feel free to re-post them or re-ask them at the end of the webinar um there's a question that asks, have you noticed the effects of the concentrated plastics on the plants, which I don't think that I think you said you haven't, but I guess I would add an additional question to that, which is what do you think could be the potential effects of the plastics on the plants based on research that's been done so far? Yes, the research on this is quite interesting. We're, we're seeing that uh, for certain species that microplastics in the soil can actually start to reduce uh, germination rates um, of, of certain plants as well. So, yes, I don't know it and the research is bubbling away about this and it when it comes to something like this we don't have to just look at constructive treatment wetlands we could look at other work that's being done on on terrestrial environments as well and that is starting to show that my, uh, microplastics in soil can and not all, but can have detrimental effects to that the soil quality and um, the soil um, community uh, microbial communities which can affect plant growth and germination rates as well so again if we're looking at this for a constructed treatment wetland we have to bear that in mind um the good thing i mean i'll say with the good thing is when you have a constructed treatment wetland generally what you've got is polluted water generally that's high nitrates high phosphates a lot of kind of stuff you don't want further downstream but actually certain types of plants typha and phragmites they love that high nutrients and so what my thinking is that hopefully, although you might have some detrimental effects of microplastics up to a certain level with plant growth, hopefully that will be 
um, countered by this high nutrient load that you're giving your plants. So yes, we, we need to do more research and it's such an exciting area of research as well. Um, and it's not just constructive treatment wetlands. How are other uh, wetlands affected uh, or behaving in this way. We've currently got a big project going in the Philippines to see how mangroves are filtering out microplastics as well, coming in from the ocean, but also from the land as well. Or are they actually acting as microplastic producers? Do you get macroplastics coming in from the land and from the sea? They get trapped in all the pneumatophores and all the root system of those mangroves. And then because of the, of the, the climate as well and the heat and the sun, do those plastics start to break down and the wave action, those start to break down and then release microplastics. So how do mangroves feature in the microplastic movement? Um, and also then we've got salt marshes and oh, it gets even more exciting when you start looking at wet, wetlands and plastics. What a combination. There's so much more to do then, but you heard it here first, so watch this space. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Christian. I'm going to move on to the next speaker. So any questions that we haven't uh, managed to address, then feel free to repost those at the end. Um, I'm going to move on uh, now to Dr. Bruce Lichtenstein, who is a senior research fellow for protein engineering at the Centre for Enzyme Innovation, which is based at the University of Portsmouth. And he's going to talk to us today about his work developing biochemical and enzymatic solutions to major environmental challenges, including plastics uh, relating to polymer degradation and recycling. So, uh, Bruce, if you're ready, I'll pass to you. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you, yes. yes. Okay. And I can see your okay. presentation. Yes. Excellent. <clears throat> um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so I'll be talking today about sort of um, what we do in the CEI in general. So we're, we're a team of researchers focused on um, a range of different uh, levels and scales of identifying biological solutions or biochemical solutions for plastic pollution. Um, uh, today, I'll be focusing on how that um, can be thought of in terms of microplastics. Um, but to give you all a brief introduction of, of what it is that we think about, um, so we're really interested in sort of the fundamental conceit of taking um, plastics that are, are consumer or post-consumer grade or even pre-consumer that are, are needing to be uh, it's put through waste streams um, and using biological solutions, in this case, enzymes to break those plastics down to fundamental monomers or more useful um, pieces. Uh, so shown here is basically a, a PET bottle that did, gets degraded by um, an enzyme called petase into the fundamental monomers of TPA and ethylene glycol. Um, from here, you can envision actually chemically reconstructing the bottle completely from, um, from these monomers without any loss of mechanical or physical properties. Um, but in addition, you can also take these carbon sources and upcycle them to other more useful chemicals. Um, as I was mentioning before, the CEI is actually a um, recently formed uh, research institute um, uh, and we actually have a number of teams working across this field um, from microbiologists and an environmental um, marine scientists looking at uh, identifying organisms within uh, environments and, and ultimately the genes that they're producing um, to see whether they are actually able to um, change the way the biology is actually interacting with and digesting plastic so we, we can so we as engineers can take those um, particularly enzymes, uh, increase their activity um, and improve their production so that we can then deploy them into uh, industrial settings. Um, we have recently undergone an expansion um, and we will be expanding our um, team to include um, applications of these things. So actually looking at whether we can um, not only resynthesize currently existing polymers, but also to um, envision creating polymers that are easier for, for biochemical processes to digest. Um, and so you can envision actually having uh, that back and forth um, as illustrated here. Um, we have lots of contacts to industry, non-governmental um, uh, research organizations, um, as well as uh, other academic groups across the world. Um, <clears throat> so the way we, we think about plastics is a bit different than um, the previous talk. So we're going from <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going from a uh, macro scale perspective to a very micro, very, very uh, molecular scale perspective. And one of the things to, to really understand is that when we think of, of a bottle of, of PET plastic, it isn't really a single, it's a single chemical entity, but it isn't necessarily a single um, type of 
entity that the enzyme would interact with. It's not a single entity that, say, the plant, like biological systems would interact with. Um, in fact, there's a rather simplistic per, um, description of these things as having amorphous, so this is sort of random regions and then crystalline regions. Um, and so what we see here on, on the left is back in the 1960s, NASA was interested in the mechanical properties of plastics and identified that um, the crystalline phase of PET shown here as, as these sort of, um, I, I see them as sort of tumors or, or uh, some sort of biological growth, um, that you actually form these sort of uh, PET spherulites. Uh, so the PET naturally forms sort of sphere-like um, crystals. Um, and we see these actually arising when we take uh, an untreated amorphous coupon um, so this is just a flat piece of uh, plastic film, and we treat it with some of the best enzymes that we have to our, our, um, in our uh, toolbox, and we see these little sort of spheres that are left behind. Those are the same. Um, and so basically what we found is that we have this fundamental challenge of um, the enzymes attacking globally plastics. Um, this is true across um, at least the ones that we've tested so far. The crystalline phase becomes quite difficult to digest. Uh, the reason why this is relevant is that um, this is also a rather simplistic view of, of, of plastics, but when we think about microplastics, it isn't simply the microplastic itself, it's the origin of the microplastic, it's how it's gotten integrated, um, and it's where that ultimate source was. Despite this, these features and these challenges um, in degrading plastics, and in, in particular PET, quite a bit of progress has been made in engineering enzymes to improve their function. Um, and so the CEI got started off the basis of a paper where it was the, one of the first reports of a rational or semi-rational approach to um, improving the activity of the Idonella petase, which is the famous petase known around the world, um, by introducing point mutations that increased its activity. Um, the critical piece of this, this paper was actually a, a molecular and structural description of why that activity changed. Um, and from there, it opened the door to large numbers of other groups. Um, in just the last year, there was a, a great paper published through Iterative Computational Redesign, where they took PETES, the Idonella enzyme, and through iterative rounds of, of redesign and analysis and interpretation of the data, they were able to drive the, the activity up as well as the melting temperature. Um, these are correlated because actually at higher temperatures, the plastic becomes a little bit looser and the enzymes are better able to digest it. Um, notably, this new enzyme, which is, they call Durapetase, has the ability to sort of consistently digest microplastics over um, extended periods of time. Um, in addition to these sort of rational techniques for uh, improving the function of the enzymes, um, the, the systems have actually started to break open to directed evolution. Um, in fact, there's a, a paper currently in the chem archives that it shows a very, very careful study of, again, the petase enzyme, uh, iterative improvements over generations of, of um, directed evolution, increasing the product yields, and ultimately also increasing the thermal temperature, the melting temperature um, of the enzyme. And so what we, we, we think we, we have here is a general description of um, one, one domain approach towards improving activity, which is to increase its melting temperature. Um, this allows you to have more permissive conditions, as I mentioned, for digesting plastics, but it also increases the stability of the protein. So there's not this competing factor of the enzyme dying on a surface, which is a constant concern when you're dealing with solid um, substrates. Um, in addition to this, there I'd like to highlight some other very creative work that, that the teams um, at the center and uh, our collaboration partners at NREL in the US have done, which is actually to create enzyme fusions. Um, this takes advantage of the unique properties of uh, another enzyme called metase or mhetase, um, which digests the product, uh, pr principal product, aromatic product from petase down to TPA, so that final um, aromatic diacid. Um, and through this study, they actually identified that there was a substantial improvement in the activity of the fusion uh, over just petase alone and over petase plus metase. Um, I believe it was a six-fold increase in activity, which is amazing. Um, this is an enzyme that operates under uh, more mesophilic-like conditions, um, therefore allowing us to begin to think about how we would do applications in environmental samples, right? We don't want to be boiling our wetlands. Um, so we're starting to think like, so can we use fusions like this to be able to start processing things at uh, more permissive, more environmentally relevant temperatures? Um, but I want to come back to this question of microplastics. Um, one of the things that, that you begin to sort of realize as you're looking at the enzymes is that, you know, we 
we as humans in interacting with plastics consider them a single material. Um, you know, a PET bottle is the same as polyester. I mean, obviously they feel different, um, but fundamentally they are different. Um, in fact, actually the, the microstructures even below what we see here are different. And you can envision that the, the microplastics that arise from a bottle having wave actions and degradation in the environment will be fundamentally different than the um, mechanical degradation of microplastics um, that are coming from laundry, um, which are probably, you know, these are obviously both in our environmental samples, but we also expect that enzymes are going to interact with these differently. And so um, we we begin to sort of start to think about how to, to approach these sort of different um, solutions by investigating what the enzyme degradation looks like on the precursor materials. Um, and so we've looked at um, how the enzymes react to um, pre-consumer fabric materials, uh, pure polyesters. And, and it turns out that the, the enzymes, at least the Idenella enzyme um, at normal uh, reaction temperatures, which is about 30 C, um, uh, doesn't actually have much of, a, of an effect on those uh, materials. And this is actually might not be the worst thing. Um, ultimately, we don't we can start to think about how we would use these things. And one of our questions will be, can we actually target microplastics over our consumer plastics, right? We don't wanna create an enzyme solution that destroys you know, fundamentally the properties of the material um, that we're interested in using, but rather the waste that's coming off of that material. Um, so what we've also been doing, as I mentioned in the, the beginning of this talk, is the CI has a large number of projects also on just a sort of more discovery phase. Uh, and in going through the discovery phase and looking at enzymes that are identified um, across all clades of life, um, mostly microorganisms, bacteria, and fungi, um, we found that there are actually surprising properties that come out that are under genetic control. Um, we have the typical ones. We have we can see that there are pH optimums. The, the melting temperature of the enzyme is different. We have cofactor binding, not cofactor binding the optimum buffer conditions, protein stability, kinetics, substrate binding. These are typical things that you expect to find within enzymes. Um, what we weren't expecting was actually to start to, to realize that there are, are specific sequence determinants that define whether enzymes can actually digest mechanically disrupted versus, um, versus sort of more pristine surfaces. So if, if we think back to the, the slide where I showed you the um, SEM images of the plastic, the pristine surface of that, that film being completely flat versus something that has been mechanically disrupted, something that has gone through the process that, in which microplastics are formed. Um, and we've actually found enzymes that seem to prefer those mechanical disruptions, which is great news for, for investigating and using microplastics um, in terms of as a substrate. So going forward, the way that we're thinking about this is how do we get these enzymes um, into situations where they can encounter and be useful for mi microplastic degradation. And, and just sort of all on top, so very similar to the la last talk, just on top of, of the head, we, you know, we can envision um, creating consumer products where, where you add these enzymes to, say, laundry powder or something. Um, and so that would require certain engineering on our part to improve their function under those conditions. This, there's a classic example um, of proteases that are found in laundry powder, the, the most extensively modified, most extensively engineered enzymes in the world. And you can envision actually doing the same thing for microplastics. Um, there's some caveats here, um, and we, I can discuss those more in particular if those questions arise. Um, but in addition, again, leading back to the previous talk, um, you can envision, especially from waste streams that are coming from uh, general consumers from in the wash and whatever, um, directed evolution of organisms that are used in microbial mats for, for um, sewage treatment. And indeed, you can envision the same thing for looking at the, the bacteria uh, within the rhizosphere um, and in evolving them to actually be able to export and produce um, plastic degrading enzymes, in this case, petases, or you can envision any other enzymes as we move forward. Um, there was a recent report and that got a lot of press about how um, the environmental bacteria have been changing to the presence of plastics. Some of that may be new enzymes that are rising naturally because this is a new carbon source within the environment. Um, and so it's it's clear that that approach combined with sort of a more directed uh, approach from our perspective may lead to organisms that are natural but have the ability to digest plastics under permissive conditions, so under environmental conditions. Um, and then finally, again, sort of uh, touching on, on topics brought up in the previous talk, um, the ability for us to capture micro nanoplastics by filtration and then bringing those into a centralized waste stream. So you can envision operating a wetland where um, it operates until it gets 
at some saturation level, the wetland is reprocessed, those plastics are collected, the wetlands recreated, and the plastics then go into a waste stream that has already been uh, used with plastics, uh, plastic degrading enzymes. Um, and so you can envision that there are approaches that actually both apply enzymes, but also the, the technologies that are being developed at larger sort of ecological scales. And so finally, um, because this was quite a bit of work, and ongoing work uh, from a large number of people. I'd like to uh, obviously recognize the, the researchers behind um, a substantial quantity of it. Um, the directors of the CEI, so John and Andy, as well as uh, Simon Craig, who's our um, marine biologist lead, um, and the, the postdoc, Luzana Avalon, uh, and PhD students, Lily and Rosie, have contributed substantially, in addition to our um, partners at NREL, uh, led by Greg Beckham. And then finally, um, for those of you who are interested in sort of the innovation activities of the CEI, Rory Myrills is an excellent point of contact and you'll find his email there. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bruce. That was a really excellent overview of what you're doing at CEI and really interesting to me because a lot of this is, is quite new. I don't work in this area, so a lot of learning opportunities for me here as well. And what I find uh, really interesting, especially as you talking about thinking about the applications of this within the environment. So my understanding at the moment is that this is very much a lab scale operation, but you know, thinking yeah, so about I mean, things like temperatures it, and so on that would work. Yeah. I mean it's it's an interesting question, right? So petes, I'd know in fact all of the petes that we know to date, excluding the ones that have been well, actually, so the origin of all the petes we know to date are all natural, right? These are all natural enzymes that exist in the environment. And so um, some of them are working in hot springs and, and conditions like that. But Idenella is an organism that I think its optimum growth temperatures in the 20s, um, which which leads you to, to realize that these enzymes, though their activities might not be have been so far optimized for low temperatures, we might actually have quite a bit of headspace for doing like the directed evolution for improving for the industrial sort of lab scale processes, but also doing directed evolution for working in environmental temperatures. Um, and it's just, it's not been attempted just because of the way the field has gone, but obviously there's quite a bit of benefit from us, from us doing so. Um, so, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And um, you've got a question from Ian Elliott and you mentioned sewage treatment works and he's asked a question, um, would it be possible to use these enzymes in an anaerobic digestion environment to assist with the destruction of plastics prior to land spreading? Yeah, so the, the, the one nice thing about the enzymes is that um, because they're biological, because they're enzymes, they have a high specificity for their substrate. And so the, what the, what I mean by this is that when you think about chemical processes for for doing this, there was a question earlier about how non-specific photooxidation or photodegradation using metals was going to be. These enzymes, on the other hand, because they're 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 biological, they're they're sort of evolved for for very specific actions. They're very specific to those those substrates and can handle a large number of uh, conditions. So yes, you can obviously use petes uh, and metes or, or whatever in an anaerobic environment before it's it's um, Put out basically, um, so it's entirely possible. Um, they don't need oxygen. So, Great, yeah. thank you. Um, there's another question, and I'm not sure I fully understand this, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, it's a question about degradation and removal from households in decentralized ways. So, can we make the lab scale decentralized, or will <laughs> will it be more effective than centralized? I don't know if that if that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I get where that's coming from. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the I think. It's not. It's not. It's probably the most commonly used consumer catalyst or consumer enzymes are these proteases that are found within um, within laundry detergent. These are in sort of every laundry powder that's um, used, um, and these are consumer grade. This is distributed, right? This is lab scale experiments in your laundry in your uh, laundry washing machine. Um, and the idea is that yes, and of course you can you can do the same. You can conceive of the same thing of using plastic degrading enzymes in your laundry. There's obviously the caveat there that you don't want to be destroying the clothing that's made out of the plastic. So you have to balance those activities. Um, uh, on the other side of things, um, we do think that there's probably quite a bit of efficiency gain to be using a combined waste stream. Um, and so something like using wetlands to filter the microplastics before they're then processed in a combined waste stream um, would be probably quite valuable. So basically both are useful and, and can be done for different purposes, obviously. Great. Thank you. Um, so we don't currently have any more questions and I think the time is right to move on. So thank you, Bruce, sure. for your uh, presentation. Thank you, Alice. Uh, could you hear me OK? Yes, I can hear you and see you. Excellent. Thank you.
and I would share my screen. So let's see. Could you see my screen? Yes, I can see it. OK, excellent. Um, thank you very much, uh, Angie, Alice, Chris, Bruce, Helen, um, for giving a solid uh, research uh, aspects of microplastics. And as Angie and Alice said, that I would probably talk about a little bit on the systems scale. Uh, but life cycle assessment is uh, extremely important now, uh, given that uh, also Angie said, emphasized that to progress the technology readiness level, we need to apply process integration, uh, the chemical engineering principles to integrate and to mitigate uh, utility consumption in the process that we develop. And also we need to uh, understand the life cycle impacts on the environment. We also need to understand socioeconomic impacts of um, the process or technology that we develop. So I'm going to give some backgrounds and how we have applied such tools and techniques uh, in some uh, environmental biotechnological questions. So um, I would change the slide and I believe you can uh, see the slide change. That's not a problem. So yeah, we need to learn about the sources of microplastics at the first place because we say pollutants are best eliminated at the sources. The removal of pollution sources means not to generate the pollution at the first place. And this could be related to the demand reduction. So how can you reduce the demand knowing that, well, the microplastics could be coming out from the uh, car tires, maybe less driving. Uh, pandemic actually um, taught us how to work from home efficiently for majority of the professions. I mean, for many of the professions, not for the uh, frontline uh, uh, front workers. Um, moving away from fast fashion where possible, use of less cosmetics, personal care where possible, and uh, reducing city dust, road markings, or improving such products and their environmental footprints that will reduce the environmental footprint of the entire life cycle. And uh, also, um, for example, tailpipe emissions uh, from uh, transport can be eliminated by electric car usage. So there are various behavioral aspects you could look at when you think about the systems. How can we reduce the microplastic generation at the first place? Um, and then um, let's define microplastics, which Alice has already uh, said, and she's the real expert in the field, and I have cited her work in this uh, slide. Uh, less than a few millimeters of largest dimension progressively degraded polymers are known as microplastics. We have heard about their damaging impacts on the environment, example, disappearance of marine and freshwater species. We also directly consume microplastics. For example, when we breathe in air or we um, eat uh, food or we drink, uh, then also we uh, constantly um, intake microplastics. And mar microplastics are universally very um, detrimental to health of humans and the environment ecosystem. Um, so microplastics are in the environment um, uh, are, are causing uh, challenges because the microplastic production is steeply rising. The kind of plastics that uh, at industrial level we deal with have seven grades. Grades one, two, five, polyethylene terephthalate, high density polyethylene and polypropylene are recyclable. And usually we are able to manage such plastics at the material recovery facilities at industrial scale. Grades three, four and six, polyvinyl chloride, low density polyethylene and polystyrene can be recycled with medium level difficulties. And grade seven, mixed plastic waste, we have absolutely no clue. And these are 
toughest to recycle and usually uh, we simply burn away the plastic. So that means resource uh, losing the resource to the environment and causing pollution to the environment. So they cause stresses on the environment. Following from uh, size, density and visual separation, microplastics can be extracted by dilute hydrogen peroxide treatment, sodium chloride flotation, digestion, and chemical dissolution and alteration, namely Fenton and basic Pirana oxidation. A diagram here taken from the published literature shown uh, needed to compute the various mass and energy flows. And after formally deploying process integration, that is in process heat and electricity recovery for in process usage, the any additional requirement of utilities must be supplied externally. And the, those utilities and raw materials will come from the environment and that will disturb the ecosystem. So what we want to understand is the system and in environmental interactions through life cycle assessment. So let's move on to the life cycle assessment. The methodology is uh, standardized by the International Organization for Standardization 140404, uh, 41, 42, 43, and 44. The methodology comprises interactive four stages, goal and scope definition, inventory analysis, impact assessment, and interpretation. So the first phase, I'm not sure whether you can read my um, slides. Maybe it's a bit uh, too small, the writing, but I'm happy to share the slides uh, later on uh, with whoever would, would be interested to get the slides. The goal and scope definition is about defining functional units and uh, system uh, and also the boundaries, the activities that we are going to consider. Then we establish the mass and energy flows. Now that by transfer equations or by steady state modeling, we need to understand the different uh, flows, mass and energy flows, the quality and the quantity. And then for each of these flows, we um, extract the uh, inventories in terms of pollution at the elemental level and in terms of resources again at the elemental level. And then we, we have a sense of absolute sustainability, not always quantified, but we then compare how these emissions and these resources um, impact the environment. And that's about life cycle impact assessment. There are standard methods uh, such as globally accepted methods like recipe method, which gives about 16 different impact categories. And every year, um, the characterization factors of the various pollutants and resources are updated. And those characterization factors are applied to the different inventories that we just established. And then um, we report the studies, uh, the study results to stakeholders the way they would like to see. Uh, finally, the inter uh, sorry, finally, the interpretation stage, that's about product process improvement, policy making, strategy development, uh, helping with the marketing, but also it's now legal requirement. For example, in some countries like in Denmark, it's a legal requirement that um, that we have to perform life cycle assessment to declare a product or service or process or anything as sustainable. We can't call it legally sustainable unless we have done life cycle assessment and we have shown that it is actually sustainable in the sustainability uh, absolute sense. Here I will show um, a sludge digestion system. The, uh, the work was done a while ago, actually 2014, uh, producing biogas and digested matter. The concept can be applied to a microplastic digestion system, but at that point I looked at sludge, um, waste, uh, wastewater uh, sludge um, anaerobic digestion producing biogas for energy generation and digested matter for agricultural application. On left, it illustrates the compositional data needs to establish mass and energy balance flows between units and between the process and the environment. 
And on right, it, it shows global warming potential, acidification potential, and photochemical oxidant creation potential. That is basically urban smog um, in a stage-wise um, aspects. And you can see some of the environmental um, impacts are shown as negative values. And those imply that the biogenic carbon utilization in making those products. Uh, provided biomethane displaces natural gas in our um, uh, gas grid to, uh, for example, for the provision of cooking, heating, etc., then we can uh, compare how this system, biogas system, um, uh, compare against natural gas-based system in like-by-like -like technologies, such as fuel cells that we have seen here, um, polymer exchange fuel cell, gas turbine system, uh, etc. The results are then presented in a comparative basis, um, such as avoided impacts by the sludge to energy generation uh, systems, displacing natural gas system, considering cradle to grave, which is basically from raw material acquisition through to end use and uh, end of life recycle uh, and waste management. And these impacts come from uh, sludge acquisition through to end uh, energy usage. Finally, I would uh, like to highlight a few plastic oriented projects. They are not exactly related to the microplastic uh, remediation. However, they are um, they uh, mostly th th these works are um, are focused on the uh, polymer synthesis, sustainable polymer synthesis um, at the formulation stage. So polyhydroxybutyrate synthesis is about integrating metabolic pathways through uh, processes to hold uh, social, economic, environmental systems to embed life cycle sustainability, uh, thinking in the biochemical system design stage. Then mixed plastic waste grades three to seven that are toughest to, to recycle, we will uh, carry out a life cycle assessment to design their integrated recycling technologies. Uh, then we uh, briefly look into the plastic recycling, uh, contaminated plastic recycling from the healthcare sector that are presently incinerated and there is no energy recovery uh, provisions in most of the facilities. And the, finally, the novel biopolymer uh, synthesis aspect. Starting with the uh, polyhydroxybutyrate synthesis research, we I would call it that we make a novel methodological contribution in this work by embedding the life cycle optimization to target pathways and functionalities. You can see from this diagram that we have modeled the intrinsic spatial and temporal interactions between metabolic, genetic, biological, reaction separation utility and environmental, social, economic uh, systems to optimize the whole system. Uh, the pathways in the halophilic uh, system were then modeled for metabolic flux analysis and mass and energy transfer models based on re reaction pathway equations. And we also from there did the reactor, reactor design. Then the system scale evaluations involve um, process simulation of the whole process, applying the process integration principles. Then we evaluate the economics and we carry out the life cycle assessment to justify uh, the productivity and the purity of the of polyhydroxybutyrate by metabolic pathways. Uh, mixed plastic waste. Uh, now, mixed plastic waste constitutes about 8 to 10 percent of municipal solid waste in the UK. Uh, it, usually, the material recovery facilities can um, separate the uh, grade one, which is polyethylene terephthalate, and high density, and grade two, which is high density polyethylene uh, 
but grades three to seven are very difficult to separate uh, in the material recovery facilities. So what, what can we do with that? So we worked with the um, Swindon Council and Recycling Technologies Company to scale up the process uh, from zero to actually nine. Um, but the process is on uh, thermochemical based and we produce here um, marine biofuel uh, to displace the conventional fossil based fuel or some biomaterial. And actually life cycle assessment was applied at the um, technology readiness level zero to inform the design decisions to, uh, to optimize the design configurations. Um, and then uh, in this project, on the healthcare project, about 133 kiloton annual contaminated polymers from uh, NHS, the National Health Services of the UK, and 250 ton of annual contaminated polymers from each university lab are generated and are burnt away because they are contaminated to use. But what we are looking at is resource recovery. So instead of incinerating, we are trying to produce the recycled plastics to go back to the value chain so that we can reduce the fresh material. Uh, then the novel biopolymer synthesis, this work, it, uh, we are on the second year of this knowledge transfer um, partnership project that is Innovate UK funded project. And we have arrived at a viable um, novel biopolymer formulations with improved um, UV aging, fire retardancy, chemical material uh, properties. And we are researching, enhancing the life cycle durations and the numbers so that the producer has better control of its um, value chain. Um, some resources here that we have written a biopolymer uh, chapter for uh, an authored book uh, from Wiley and some other resources talking about life cycle assessment um, and the first the top one is is the link to Denmark um, URL showing that life cycle assessment will be essential to call a system sustainable and collaboration opportunities finally uh, within Ibinet, which Angie has discussed already and we are running the life cycle assessment uh, module uh, uh, online and here is my uh, email address. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juma. That was really interesting and really great to look at this issue from the very high level perspective now, so the large scale. And I guess this is more thinking about how we prevent this stuff from becoming a problem in the first place, how we prevent it from entering the environment. So almost the other end of the scale from what some of the other presented uh, presenters have, have looked at today. Um, so there, uh, let me have a look. I think there was one question. There is a question. I'm not sure this is your expertise. It's probably more for me, actually, but I'll ask it to you because it's directed to you, uh, which says, is there a standardised methodology for separation of microplastics from fresh water? Do you know anything uh, about that? Uh, yeah, I think it is. It is probably your question, but I had put a slide on the on the separation that is about filtration, some size separation, some uh, the density separation, visual separation, and then you eventually come to more of a destructive uh, technologies like anaerobic digestion or chemical alteration uh, to make it yeah, usable uh, resources. Excellent, thank you. Um, there are a couple more questions. So Angie says, when you're working with healthcare materials, do you have an extra layer of life cycle assessment consideration for potential pathogen assessment and removal? Uh huh. Uh, so the the pointer is on the how do I um, remove the pathogen? Well, we are uh, using disinfectants, some novel formulations to uh, remove the pathogens, and then we are. Um, yeah, working on the um, size reduction and then pelletizing to um, get the plastics back and put that in the value chains. Excellent. Um, Louise Byfield asks, of all the technological interventions that society could start with to deal with microplastics, what do you think is the low hanging fruit or essentially the easiest 
uh, option that you could use to start off with, because obviously there are lots of different ways in which you could do this. Very good question, actually. Um, thanks. Um, um, it's a bit difficult to um, to say which one is the low hanging fruit. Uh, targeted to uh, microplastics because I could imagine that yes, anaerobic digestion could be one um, option, and we could uh, well if, if we if we go through all four stages of anaerobic digestion, then methanogenesis, and we produce biomethane, um, and uh, hopefully microplastics would be turned into biomethane. However, we could also stop at some intermediate stages and uh, produce hydrogen or produce some volatile fatty acids. Um, it would be worthwhile, but I have not done this uh, aspect of uh, targeted microplastic remediation and which would be the low hanging um, uh, option. OK, thank you. Um, so I have one question. Maybe at least you could answer this question which you think is the easiest uh, within environmental biotechnology domain to um, to deal with microplastics? Sorry, were you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, that would be a difficult question for me to answer because I biotechnology is not really my expertise. I'm more looking at the kind of aspects of where plastics are in the environment and how they are accumulating and the effects that they're having. So in terms of the actual technologies, I think that'd be very difficult, difficult for me to answer as well. And I think it comes back to that, that sort of point that I posed at the beginning, which is almost I don't think there is one solution because we have so many different issues with different materials and different applications that you could say, well, we can target one, but actually it will maybe solve one very specific problem, but it won't then target all the other ones. I, you know, if we're talking about enzymes, for example, Bruce and Helen have talked a lot about PET as a specific polymer that could be easily degraded because of the PETase enzyme. So I think with respect to enzymatic degradation, we could say let's target PET because we know it's widely used. It's widely present in the environment in the form of plastic bottles and so on. Um, so I think that would be a way to go. But in terms of the bigger scale picture, I think there's going to be more than one solution, definitely. <laughs> yeah, um, in fact, I saw your uh, your paper, Alice. Um, I think you contributed to one of the, the this one I have cited here, um, which gives the kind of technological space we are looking at and digestion definitely appears in there. Um, yes. I think we here you, you can see here, yeah, the, the, the three of the papers that I have referred here are from your work. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, I think there are lots of. Yeah, so ways this is a kind of a, this is a paper I found on microplastic uh, remediation. If you want to yeah. take a snapshot, I can. I'm happy to send this uh, these slides around. Yeah. Thank you.